to attend this conference. Okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, so my talk is about application of optimal transport. So my research area is in optimal transport is quite pure. But however, because this uh, conference is about applied, so I'm trying to uh, mainly focus on some kind of applications. So my talk has four parts. So in part one, uh, oh, by the way, if, if my voice or my video uh, uh, has a problem, please let me know because my internet is not so good. Okay, my talk has four parts. So in part one, I'm going to give a very brief introduction about the optimal transportation and also um, the bojan pair equation um, arising from that area. So in the second part, I'm going to introduce that application in cosmology. So what we're going to do is we use optimal transport to trying to understand how our universe is going to evolve. And then the third part is very quick application in geometry. We prove isometric uh, inequality by using optimal transport. Um, and of course, if you work in geometry, you know there's many different kind of proofs. But by using optimal transport, we can give a very um, short and a very quick proof and quite interesting. And then the last part is application of optimal transport in the image recognition, so which may uh, be most related to this conference. Um, it's also related to the optimal transport and from the hypercube from square to square. All right, let me start. So the first part, let me introduce what is called optimal transport. Um, this area is, um, as we mentioned before, is quite popular in recent years. So probably you already know, um, or some of you already know the series, but what I'm going to do is give a very brief introduction. Okay, it's not 100% precise, but just give you the rough idea what's going on. So the optimal transport, imagine we have some kind of material in the initial domain omega. So you can imagine it's some kind of um, product. And then we have a target and target is a different domain omega star. And we're trying to move the product from initial domain omega to the target domain omega star by a mapping T. Okay, so over omega and omega star, we have some kind of distribution, rho and rho star. And of course we are going to assume the total mass or the total weight are the same. So that means integration of the rho should equal integration of the rho star, right? So in this talk, we assume rho and rho star are probability measures. So that means the total energy or total mass is exactly equal to one because it's probability. Okay. And the optimal mapping, oh, sorry, the mapping T. So it's a mapping from omega to omega star. We need this mapping to be measure preserving. So measure preserving, that means you consider the local the a local a sub a subset. Okay, you imagine this subset is mapping to a different target. Then the energy or the mass, the weight over these two domains should be balanced. So that means when you do the job, nothing is going to lost and uh, nothing extra is going to gain. Okay, so you have to uh, make sure the mass is balanced between initial domain and target domain. Okay, and then very important, we have a cost function. So the cost function C, that means, imagine you are going to transport a single point from X to another point Y. Then the C, X, Y, it tells you what's your cost. It could be how much money you're going to spend or how, many, how much energy you're going, uh, you going to use, okay? So it's a, it's a cost function. And then when you use the mapping T to finish your job, so how much in total you're going to cost it's exactly we are going to integrate the cost function over the whole domain omega, right? And here is a density function rho. So this functional tells you, the value of the functional tells you what's the total energy or what's the total cost uh, you have to spend, okay? Then the optimal, uh, sorry, the optimal transportation problem is to consider how can we minimize, so how can we minimize this total cost? Um, if you can use a special mapping T to finish your job, such that the total cost is minimized, then your mapping T will be called optimal mapping. Okay, so that's the roughly, it's a story, it's a very brief introduction about optimal transportation. Okay, so as you can see, the optimal 
transportation is heavily depend on the cost function. So the different kind of cost function give you different kind of problem. The original cost function the Munch in 1781. So the cost function Munch is going to use is exactly the Euclidean distance. So that is X minus Y, the distance. I mean, although it's the initial cost function, but however, it turns out it's pretty hard, the problem. And then if we change the cost function to a log function, such as the log X minus Y, then the problem is related to the so-called reflector design or the antenna design problem. So what does that mean? That means you imagine you have a light source, such as a laser, okay? And from the light source, the different direction, you have the different light, the ray, okay? And then you have a target, and imagine you have a very big uh, reflector, the mirror. Then when the lights touch the mirror, it will be reflected and to illuminate another different point in the target. So the question is, imagine we have the target, given target, and we have the given, um, we have the given light source and how to de design, how to design such a mirror or how to design such a reflector. So this problem is called reflector design. It's actually very useful because it's related to the satellite. So imagine you are, you're trying to construct a satellite, then you have a very, very big reflector and how to, how to, how to make that one uh, optimal. And also when you, because everyone is driving a car, right? So if you consider the headlights of the car, so, and again, the highlight is not a reflector, but it's refractor, right? So it's very, uh, it's a very related problems. So this one is uh, actually optimal transport with the cost function equal to log, okay? And now if I consider different cost function, the log X inner product with Y is related to the convex geometry. Um, the Alexandrov problem is very famous. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this in, um, in, in today's talk. And however, for mathematician and especially people in PDE, the our favorite cost function, the best cost function we uh, we can understand is the quadratic cost function. That is a half x minus y squared. Okay. Now let's move on. So what's the reason why we everyone in PDE likes the x minus y squared? Because theoretically we can prove this cost function is actually equivalent to the product x dot y. Okay. And more importantly, in this case, we can also prove the optimal mapping T is actually given by a gradient of some function U. So T is actually equal to DU. And the U is not an arbitrary function. It's, it has a very beautiful um, property. So for example, the U is a convex function. And moreover, this convex function satisfied a boundary value problem of a motion pair equation. So that is a determinant D to U. So this is a Hessian matrix. So if you're considering Rn, this is n by n matrix, okay? So this convex function, I mean, in optimal transport, we also call this potential function. So this potential function satisfied the Mondrian pair equation. This rho and rho star exactly is the mass density, okay? And the boundary condition, the potential function satisfied is du omega equals omega star. Um, that is natural because du is exactly the mapping T. So T omega equals omega star. We use a mapping T to transport everything from omega to omega star. So that gives us the boundary, um, the boundary condition. And in PDE, we can simplify the right-hand side part such that we regard the right-hand side part is a single function F. Then this function, oh, sorry, this equation becomes the standard modern pair equation. Okay, modern pair equation is a very um, important fully nonlinear elliptic PDE. And we have the boundary condition like that, okay? Uh, now you can see, because the potential function U is convex function, so it's a Hessian matrix will be positive definite. Then when you ca calculate the determinant, the right-hand side part should be positive function, right? So in this talk, we always thinking, we always uh, assuming the right-hand side part is positive function. If it's, if it's not positive function, the problem will become extremely hard, okay? So for example, if the F function, uh, if the function F can change the sign, then it related to the, what's that called? The um, isometric embedding problem in geometry. That's pretty hard, okay? So in our talk, we only assuming the right-hand side part is a positive function. 
So our research is focused on because the optimal transport existence and uniqueness is well known. We have many different and um, many beautiful um, proofs to prove existence and uniqueness. So our research in PDE, we focus on the regularity. So regularity, that means how smooth the solution could be, okay? It's C1, C2, or C infinity. So that's our, uh, that's a topic of our, of our research. Okay. All right, so that's a standard, uh, so, sorry, that's a story for the standard cost function, the quadratic cost function. And for general cost function, let's say if the cost function is not quadratic, it's a log function or exponential function. We also have the modern pair equation um, where the U is satisfied, excuse me, where the U is satisfied a generalized modern pair equation. So the A is a matrix. So you put the matrix combined with the matrix together with the Hessian matrix, okay? And this matrix um, depends on the cost function exactly. Now you, can, now you can see if the cost function if this cost function is x dot y, then you differentiate it twice in x, it will become zero, right? So this will become zero. So that means if the cost function is a quadratic cost function, then we don't have the matrix A. But in general, we do have the matrix A, okay? If you have the matrix A and you're trying to study the regularity, so it's very natural, we need some kind of condition or some kind of assumption for the matrix A. Otherwise, there is the levy hands counterexample to tell you there's no regularity theory. Okay, so in order to assume in the cost uh, sorry, in order to assume in the condition for matrix A, equivalently, we are going to assume in the condition for cost function C. Right. So what kind of co condition we are going to assume for cost function C that is called Ma Chudinovang condition. So Ma is a Xinan Ma, uh, in UCST. And uh, Schrodinger and Wang, the, both of them are in Australia. Okay, so in 2005, Mark Schrodinger and Wang, they construct a necessary and sufficient condition. Now it's called MTW condition. So it says the cost function has to satisfy the following inequality. So it's quite long. I mean, if you are not in the mathematics uh, area in computer science, you don't need to worry about this. Okay, so it, I mean, the condition is pretty long. So the index, that means the partial derivative. Now you can see the ij, that means partial derivative in xi, xj, and ris, that means in yr and yis. So it involves the fourth order derivative of the cost functions, okay? So if the cost function satisfied MTW, that's a good cost function. And then we can prove a lot of um, beautiful regularity results. So the first one is the C1 alpha regularity. So C1 alpha regularity was uh, obtained by, um, by Gregor Loper and myself in 2009, we assume the cost function satisfied MTW. And then we can prove as far as the modern pair equation, the right-hand side part is LP. As far as the right-hand side part is LP and P is larger than N plus one over two, then we can prove the solution U will be C1 alpha. And the alpha is, can be explicitly given depending on the index P. And especially if the P equals the infinity, and then we have the alpha is one over two and minus one, that is optimal. Okay, uh, so that's the C1 alpha regularity result. Uh, okay, I, I, okay, instead of giving all the details for the proof, I just give you a very rough idea, okay. Uh, okay, I'm not sure if that is proper in this conference, but in order to prove a function C1 alpha, let's assume the function U is a convex function. Okay, if the U is a convex function, then we can define the so-called sublevel set. So the sublevel set, that means imagine you have the minimum point is um, at an origin, and then you lift the, um, the tangent plane by a height h. Then you cut, cut off the graph of the function U and uh, project it into the variable space. Then you have, um, some kind of domain. This domain is called sublevel set. Okay. Now let's imagine we are going to shrink this h to shrink the h to be zero. So that means you cut it lower and lower. So simultaneously, your sublevel set will shrink and become smaller and smaller and smaller. And until h goes to zero, it converges to a single dot. 
right? So in order to prove the regularity for the function, it's equivalent to see we are going to study how fast this sublevel set is going to shrink. If the sub if if this sublevel set is shrinking to a single point very quickly, so that means the function is very sharp at this point. If the sublevel set is shrinking very slowly, very smoothly, so that means the function is smooth at this point. Okay, roughly speaking. Now, if you trying to prove the function is C1 alpha, and of course the sublevel set will be um, some kind of convex set, and the convex set we can approximate by using ellipsoid. Okay, so let's assume in you have an ellipsoid sublevel set, and this radius is R1, and the lowest one is Rn. So in order to prove the function is C1 alpha, equivalently, as far as you can prove H is bounded by Rn with the power one plus alpha, then that means the function will be C1 alpha smooth. Okay. So that's how um, the idea is going. Now we use the assumption, the cost function satisfied MTW. And by using the MTW condition, we can prove uh, the following inequality. So that is H, R1, R1 is the largest radius, okay, of the sublevel set. So this part, this radius is R1, okay, and the smallest one is Rn. Then we can prove H multiply R1 square over Rn square is bounded. It's bounded by a constant, okay. And then you can apply the volume estimate. So volume estimate and hold the inequality, what does that mean? That means we have the modern pair equation. Uh, let me uh, go back to here. We have the modern pair equation. You do the integration on both sides, okay? You do the integration on both sides, and after that, you use the holder inequality, and you can obtain another inequality, that is H with the power N is bounded by the product of all Ri with the power two minus uh, one over P, okay? Now, as far as you have inequality one, you have inequality two, combine them together by a very easy calculation. You can prove H with the power is bounded by Rn with a different power. And then you put this power downstairs here and you can obtain H is bounded by Rn with the power one plus alpha. And that alpha can be explicitly given and it depend on P and depend on N. So that's how we prove the C1 alpha regularity. And I mean, if you work in the modern pair equation, you can compare the result um, with the Caprelli classical C1 alpha result. And then you realize for the standard modern pair, Caffrelli proved the solution C1 alpha, but however, um, there's no explicit estimate for the alpha. Okay, and now we have explicitly um, formula for the alpha. What's the reason why? Because we have one more stronger condition that is a cost function satisfied MTW condition. Okay, it's, it tells us MTW is very useful. And moreover, for a higher order regularity, if the cost function satisfied MTW, what, 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 what can we prove? We can prove as far as the right-hand side part is smooth, then the solution will be smooth. And of course, the domain has to be uniformly convex, okay? So in that case, the modern pair equation or the mass density or the distribution is smooth, then we can prove the solution U is smooth. If solution U is smooth, then the optimal mapping T, which is related to the gradient of the U, will also be smooth. So we know the optimal mapping will be smooth. Okay. Um, and regarding the above conditions, what can we say? We, can, uh, we actually know MTW condition is not only sufficient, it's also necessary. So what does that mean? That means, suppose if the MTW condition not satisfied, if you have a very bad cost function, it's not, not satisfied MTW condition then we can construct kind of counterexample such that the right-hand side part is smooth, but however, the solution is not even C1. If the solution U is not C1, that means the optimal mapping T is not even continuous because this guy depends on the gradient of the U, okay? So the, if U is not C1, the T, the optimal mapping T may not even be continuous. So that means MTW condition is very, very important, not is sufficient and necessary. And one more remark is about geometry condition, because we're assuming the both domain has to be uniformly convex. And if the target is not uniformly convex, sorry, if the target is not convex, then Caffrelli 
1992 and also MTW uh, paper in 2005, they prove they can construct a smooth right-hand side part such that solution not even C1. And again, the optimal mapping will not be continuous. Um, okay, so that's all the story about optimal transport, the regularity theory. For us, working in PDE, it's a um, very uh, significant job. But however, in applications, as I discussed with um, Professor Xian Feng Gu, um, they also care about the regularity because it's related to the stability when you try to do some kind of algorithm, right? Um, such that you can prove it's convergent to the, uh, to the real solution or something like that. I'm not expert, so I don't know um, what's going on in the computer science. But in mathematics, regularity theory in PDE is definitely um, significantly important. All right, now let me introduce one interesting application. So we're trying to use optimal transport to understand how um, our universe is going to evolve in the cosmology. So if you look at the picture, it says, imagine the time is equal to zero, then the whole universe is a singularity point. Okay, so that's corresponding to the Big Bang theory. So the Big Bang means when um, many years ago, when the universe is a singularity, it, it uh, involved a big explosion, right? So after explosion, and then 380,000 years, the whole universe come to the dark, dark age. So dark age, it means it totally dark. Okay, it's totally dark, so there's no light because it's quite dense, okay? So the light, um, we don't have any light. Then after 300 million years, we have a little bit small star, it's, um, it's gen it kind of um, generated. So the first star appears um, after 300 million years. Then after 1 million years, we have the galaxy. So the galaxy is, looks like a vertex, right? A lot of stars, they combine together and a lot of, um, um, things together. And after 9 million years, we have the solar system. So solar system is, from the picture, is actually on the edge of the, uh, of the whole universe, okay? So that's our sun and uh, all the planet here. The Earth is also here, okay? And up to today, up to today, that's the picture of uh, the current universe, okay? So what we are interested, we're interested given the time T0 and T1, so imagine T0 is here. That's the picture here. And T1 is a picture here, okay? We try to understand between T0 and T1, how it change. So how it evolve between 300 million years up to today. Okay, what's a, what's, a, what's a picture in between? Okay, so that's our problem. It's also called reconstruction uh, in the cosmology. And of course, you can, uh, from the PDE aspect, you can consider the Cauchy problem, or which is called initial value problems. So the Cauchy problem or initial value problem, that means you assuming the, the picture at some kind of initial time, and then you assuming, okay, let me draw a picture. You assuming a picture of the universe at time equal to T0. And at T0, you give all the velocity of each star or each galaxy. And after that, you evolve along some kind of uh, evolution PD. And then you consider what happens when the time become bigger and bigger, okay? But that's a different story. So for us, we consider the boundary problem that is given T0 and T1 and what happens in between, right? All right, so how can we use mathematics or how can we use optimal transport um, to study this problem? Okay, we assuming the density of the whole universe is given by a function rho, okay? And we're assuming the velocity field is V. So that means the velocity of each planet or of each star is equal to V. Then by using the conversation of mass, we have the equation. So that is uh, dt rho plus the gradient dot uh, rho V equals zero, okay? <coughs> but after each star has a velocity, it also has the acceleration, right? So acceleration is given by the gravitational field. So where does this come from is exactly coming from the gravity, right? So the two stars, they are going to attract each other. 
So we have the uh, acceleration field. So acceleration field is given by the minus gradient P. So P is a potential function. And the equation we have is the second equation. And because this P is a gravity, is coming from the two stars, they attract each other, it's coming from the gravity. And the, how the gravity uh, is generated is actually generated by the mass, right? So therefore we have um, a Boson equation that is a Laplacian P is equal to zero. So we have equation one, equation two, and equation three, put them together, it gives us a system. That system is describe how the universe is going to uh, is going to evolve, okay? And the boundary condition we are going to assume in is when rho, so that's a density, okay? So the density means, so for example, you look at a picture of the universe. So density means, for example, in this area, the, the value of the rho is larger because there's a very bright, a lot of stars. And uh, such as in this area, it's uh, the value of the rho will be small because it's dark, right? There's no star, okay? So we assume in when time equals zero, the density is rho zero, and when time equals capital T, the density is rho T. So that's our boundary, two ending, two ending boundary problems. Okay, then we're trying to understand what is the rho T when T is between zero and the capital T. Okay, so that's our reconstruction problem. All right, in 2006, uh, Gregor Loper, so he first uh, formulated this kind of problem as, a, as some kind of variational problems. So the functional he constructed is, uh, it, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because um, the first part is the kinetic energy and second part is the potential energy. This is coming from the gravity, right? So he defined such functional and he says, if you consider the Ola equation, the Ola equation for this functional or consider the Mean, the minimizer of this functional, it will give you exactly the second equation. So therefore, we consider we can uh, we can convert uh, the previous problem into a variational problem such that we're trying to minimize this functional subject to the equation one and the equation three. Okay, and he also assuming the universe is given by the torus. Uh, that's kind of artificial because we know the universe is not a torus, right? It does not have the periodic property. All right, so what I'm doing with uh, Greg Walloper in our joint work um, a few years ago, we replace the potential energy, the second energy, by a more general energy, the curved F. So this curved F, instead of calling this potential energy, we call this internal energy. We don't know uh, the en where the energy comes from. It could come from gravity or it could come from something else, okay? We just regard this as a mathematics question, okay? Um, actually in 2011, uh, Lee and McCann, the assuming the extra energy, the curved F is actually given by in the integration of the rho multiply Q. Where this Q is kind of external function, so, well, so what does that mean? That means they assuming the star, they do not have the gravity, they're not attracting each other, but rather than they have a very um, magic uh, power or magic field from exterior, the function Q. And the Q is given the force to every star and to change the direction of the, of, 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 of the uh, each star's velocity, okay? So therefore, this problem is also called non-interacting because the star is not talking to uh, each other. Okay. And under the above assumption, they actually prove um, the, re the reconstruction problem is optimal transport. When you talk about optimal transport, you have to specify, you have to tell people what's your cost function because we already understand different cost function give you different kind of problem. They give you different kind of equations, right? So when you when you talk about optimal transport, um, you have to tell people which op, which cost function you are going to consider, right? So they prove the above problem is optimal transport, and they they can specify the cost function is given by the following formulas. Uh, 
okay, I'm not going to get, uh, tell too much about this because the time is not enough. But let's imagine you have X and you have Y, okay? So, so what does this mean? It means you consider a different curve. The star is from X is moving to Y, or the star is X is coming from different paths, all from the different paths. And each path, it involves uh, energy. Then you take the inf, so that means you pick the optimal path when the star X travel to the star Y, okay? And that optimal path, the energy related to the optimal path is exactly the cost function from X to Y. So that's the uh, physical meaning for the cost function. So as far as you have the cost function, you can verify does this satisfy MTW condition or not. If it is satisfied MTW condition, we know the regularity theory you hold. If it does not satisfy MTW condition, we know uh, there exists counterexamples, right? So the MTW condition is you just verify um, is satisfied or not, okay? All right, so what in our job, what we are going to do is we assuming something um, different. We assuming the external force is only occurs in, in the middle. So that means initially, when you when a star from X uh, evolving to Y, initially it has a velocity and uh, no one is touching it, okay? So the star is moving along a straight line, okay? But however, when the time come to the half and suddenly there is some kind of external force is coming from Q, okay? It will change the velocity of this star and such that it changes the direction and move to a different direction and come into the terminal. Uh, so that's a prediction Y. Okay, so that's our assumption. So by this kind of simple assumption, we can formulate the functional. It's given by uh, the formula here. And similarly, the first part is a kinetic energy and second part is a, is a, is a potential energy or the internal energy. So what's the advantage we are doing this? So first, we can remove the smallest condition because in their work, they are assuming uh, epsilon. Epsilon need to be very small. They can prove it satisfies MW. But what we can do now is we can remove the epsilon. We do need to assume the external force is, um, is very small. And more importantly, what's our purpose? Our purpose, so let's imagine X is moving to Y along a smooth curve. As far as you can approximate this guy, by two segment, as far as you can do this as two parts, then along this part, along the first part, you can again repeat what you did before, right? So you can cut it again, and then you move to this part, you can do another approximation. Okay, I mean, it's a bad picture. Sorry, let me draw another picture. I mean, the essential idea is we use uh, we use uh, we use we use a lot of segment to approximate the real curve, right? So that's a very general idea in mathematics. Right? So as far as you can approximate it once, then you can use a lot of um, a lot of um, poly, poly, uh, what's that called? Uh, the polygon, right? So you use a polygon to approximate a smooth curve. So that means if we can do it once, then we let the cutoff point, the end goes to infinity, such that the whole smooth curve can be approximated. But of course you have to prove it converge, okay? So that's uh, the future idea. Um, okay. Um, I, have to, I have to speed up a little bit. So what's, uh, so what we can prove we can prove under our assumption. Um, our assumption is we only consider it cut, it will split once, okay? It will change once. If it only change once, we can explicitly to write down the path, how the star is moving. So the path is given by a vector uh, value function. It looks like this one. Um, I mean, it's, it's, too, it's too much, it's too much mathematics here. But now you imagine you have uh, already understand how a star is moving from a position X to position Y. Then what you are going to do is you calculate the Jacobi equation of that mapping. If you calculate Jacobi equation and by using the energy uh, balance condition, you will ending up with a modern pair type equation. 
Okay. And this Munchen pair type equation, you just compare this with optimal transportation. You can see they are very similar, right? You have a determinant and the Hessian matrix of potential function minus a very big matrix and is equals right-hand side part. And right-hand side part is given by the density functions. Okay, you just compare um, the modern pair equation here with the modern pair equation in the optimal transport. You can see the similarity between each other, right? So the similar, this kind of similarity is actually tells us um, it may be, it's exactly an optimal transport problem. And how to find out, okay, if we want to prove it's optimal transport, then we have to, again, we have to specify what's a cost function. And the cost function is actually coming from the matrix here, right? Because this matrix, it depends on, it's given by the cost function, okay? So by some kind of calculation, we can, uh, we can prove the cost function is actually given by the lambda transform of the external force of the external uh, potential function Q. So this Q star, it means it's a lambda transform of the Q, okay? And as far as we arrive at here, we can verify um, if the Q satisfies some kind of construction uh, structure conditions, then we can prove this new cost function. It also satisfies MTW. Once we have the MTW, we can have all the regularity um, as we want, right? By using the PDE series, okay? Um, now we, okay, we kind of, uh, probably we skip this part. It's about the mean field. Uh, the mean field, the mean field case is exactly we consider the, gra the gravity, because previously we are assuming the star is not talking to each other, so the, each star is moving independently. It's only controlled by some kind of external force. Okay, but the reality in the real life, the star is actually have the gravity. Okay, it's uh, everyone everyone knows it, right? So that's related to the mean, mean field case. So the mean field case, the potential function is actually given by a convolution. So this kernel is the standard um, cooling kernel. So that's coming from the Boson equation. Uh, we, 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 uh, we've already have that um, previously. So if the kernel satisfies the good condition, then we have the MTW. As far as we have the MTW, we have the regularity. So that's the long story short, okay? Now let's move to the second application. I mean, application of optimal transport has a lot of, okay. So I just pick um, the one I'm more interested um, recently. So let's look at the application of optimal transport in geometry. So in geometry, we have a very um, well-known inequality, which is called isometric inequalities. Um, but of course, it's, it's true in any dimension, arbitrary dimension. But in this talk, let me just show you two dimensional case, okay? So we're assuming we have a domain D in R2, which is a bounded domain. So what the isometric inequality tells us, it tells us the area, we use the A to represent the area of this um, domain, and we use the L to represent the length of the boundary, okay? So isometric inequality tells us the L square is always uh, larger or equal than four pi multiply A, okay? It's well known. And if it equals, then it has to be a, uh, it has to be a disk, right? It has to be wrong, okay? And how can we prove this? So first, instead of considering arbitrary domain, I'm actually only need to consider convex domain. Why? Because whatever domain you give to me, right? I can pick a convex envelope. So the convex envelope, that means it's a convex domain. A convex domain contain this region. Sorry, how to say that? The convex envelope is the a, is a smallest convex domain, which can contain this domain. Oh, sorry, <laughs> does that make sense? Uh, so that's the convex envelope. So if you consider convex envelope, then you can realize you actually increase the area, but however, you minimize, you minimize the length, right? So that means as far as you can prove, as far as you can prove inequality is true for convex envelope, then this inequality has to be true for arbitrary domain, okay? So that means we only consider convex domain, okay? Now, 
we are assuming the convex envelope is given by omega. What we are going to do is we pick omega star, so optimal transpose, right? The initial domain and target domain. But omega star, I'm going to pick a very round disk, okay? The round disk has the same area with omega. So that means the radius will be given by the area over pi and the square root. Uh, it's very easy to calculate because the area here is actually pi r square is equal to omega, right? So the r is equal to omega over pi and the square root. All right, so we have the initial domain, we have the target domain, and over each domain, we're assuming the mass distribution is, um, is uniform. So that means we consider Lebesgue measure over omega and omega star. And we assume the cost function is given by x, um, uh, the quadratic cost function, x minus y square over two. That's our theory, right? And then by using optimal transport, we know there exists an optimal mapping T, which minimize, uh, which can finish the job. You transport everything from omega to omega star, right? And moreover, this T is given by the gradient of the U. And the U satisfy the standard modern pair equation determined d to U equal to one and the DU omega equals omega star, okay? And once we have this relationship, we need one more assumption. We assume in the solution U is smooth. It's smooth globally, okay? If the U is smooth, then what we can do, we can, we can, we can, we can integrate the, fun, the equation um, on both sides. So we have a very trivial inequality that is, uh, square root of the determinant is actually always less than the half of the Laplace. So what does that mean? I mean, determinant d to u is equal to the eigenvalue lambda one multiplied lambda two, right? And the Laplace u is equal to lambda one plus lambda two, right? And then by using the very fundamental uh, of reason mean and the geometry mean in call T, we know lambda one, lambda two square root is always less than lambda one plus lambda two over two, right? So we know this very fundamental equality. So that gives us the relationship determinant is always less than half of the Laplace. But determinant is exactly equal to one. So it gives you the area. And Laplace by using the divergence theory, you can reduce the Laplace up to the boundary. So the boundary is a gradient. But however, the gradient is always less than the radius because the, the boundary is mapping to the boundary, right? So the gradient is always less than the length, absolutely value of the gradient is always less than the radius r. So this is less than r multiply the domain here. So that's the boundary, the length of the boundary. But the r, we already, can, we can calculate the r is explicitly given by this quantity. So you put this quantity here, you end up with the relationship between area and the length of the boundary. Combine them together, you ending up with the isometric quality. It's pretty easy to prove, right? We didn't use anything, um, anything um, difficult. We just use very fundamental inequalities. Okay, so once we have this part, we need to realize the assumption. Assumption is U has to be smooth everywhere. So that is theoretically in PDE, it's something we don't know. Uh, I mean, how to say that? We haven't proved yet, right? So how to prove the global regularity or how to you, how can you prove the solution U is smooth globally? It, the first result is actually uh, in 1991 in dimension two is by Delanoy. And then um, in higher dimension is given by Obus. Um, they assuming the both domain has to be uniformly convex and smooth. And then the right hand side part is smooth. The solution U is globally smooth, okay? And then in 1996, it's proved by Caffelli and Caffelli says he can reduce the assumption a little bit, but both domain again has to be uniformly convex. And then the right-hand side part is C alpha. We have the holder, uh, sorry, shoulder estimate. So the U will be C2 alpha. But never, nevertheless, they always need to assume in the domain is uniformly convex. Uh, I mean, if the audience is in mathematics, uh, probably you already understand what is called uniformly convex. So uniformly convex in the smooth case, so that means the curvature has the positive lower bound. Okay. So the curvature, the, the curvature of the bound uh, of the of the boundary of the domain has to be has the positive lower bound. 
But however, if you come to the convex envelope, if you come to the convex envelope, it's actually not uniformly convex because over here, the curvature is zero, right? It's a flat. It's not uniformly convex. So that means Caffrelli, Urbis, and the Delanois result, they cannot tell us the solution U is smoothly global, right? So that's something, uh, uh, um, a gap in the in the theory, but if the domain is not convex, on the other hand, we have the counter example. So the critical case is the domain is convex but not uniform convex. So that means the curvature is okay. Uniformly convex. That means the curvature is bigger than zero. Okay. So that oh no. If the curvature less than zero, we have the counter example, right? We have the counter example. So that means we don't have the regularity. So the question is, what happens if the curvature is larger or equal than zero? So that's our recent result. It's drawn to be Shi Bing Chen in UCST and uh, Shi Jia Wang in Australia in U. So what we prove, we prove as far as the domain is convex, we don't need the curvature has the lower bound. Okay. As far as it's convex domain, even it's flat, that's fine. Okay. Then we prove the right hand side part is C alpha and the solution U will be C2 alpha. So once we have the shoulder estimate, we have the smooth. So that means uh, right hand side part is smooth. The solution U will also be smooth. Okay, we done. Um, so that's application in geometry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I think uh, I run out of time. Uh, I think I only have two minutes. But let me go go through this very quickly. Okay. Um, the third application is in the image recognition because in the image recognition, the domain is actually Normal, normally, very popularly, the domain is a square. Okay, the square, although the square is a convex domain, but however, it does not have the regularity because at the corner, the corner point, it's only Lipschitz. It's not even C1, right? It's not differentiable. So the, 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 the sharp corner give us trouble. And how to handle this, uh, this case? Okay, let me just skip. Okay. So how to handle this? Our idea is to do the even reflection. So that means if you want to handle a sharp point of the square, you reflect it, reflect it, and reflect it, reflect it. Okay. So such that this sharp point will become an interior point. So if you consider a larger domain, this blue dot will become an interior. And the, if the point is interior point, we can understand the regularity very, uh, very well. Okay. As far as it do not touch the boundary, okay? So uh, then you use the regularity for the interior, you have the regularity here, and then you uh, recover it back. So that's how we handle the sharp point. But however, you have to be very careful when you do the reflection. Because even a function is C1 alpha, you reflect it, you reflect a smooth function, the, the even reflection can, in general, is only Lipschitz, right? I just give you a very uh, quick, quick picture. So imagine you have a function, so that's a function f. Imagine you have a function f like this, and you're trying to reflect it, even reflect it up to here. Then what happens? At this point, the function is only Lipschitz. It will lose the smoothness. It will lose re the regularity. That's another trouble, okay? And how to overcome this trouble is by using a partial regularity in the PD theory. So which is given by Jin Li Wang in 2015. And then we apply uh, the, partial, the partial regularity result in the PDE. We can handle um, all the difficulties and we can prove as far as the density is smooth, then the solution U will be C3 alpha. And if the U is C3 alpha, then the optimal mapping T will be C2 alpha. That's the optimal result. You cannot uh, go any higher, okay? Uh, Okay, that's about prediction, but we don't have time. Um, I think I probably need to stop here. Um, thank you very much.